all of the studying for this lesson done last week, that freed me up today to spend hours doing something that I've wanted to do for a long time. And uh, so I'm going to show it to you. Okay, so there's chronology. We've already seen that. We've already talked about the Antioch and Alexandrian lines. Simple Greek text history. And if you don't understand that, you know, we can chit-chat about it any time. Uh, so this is, if you have a Thompson Chain Bible, this is the origin and growth of the English Bible. Uh, Chris, since you can't see it, you can have that one if you want. And uh, so if you look there, um, there's some things here. There's a couple things we disagree with on this. Now, again, you know, it's about you know, who is a scholar and who's telling you they're a scholar. Uh, what are they studying? Are they even saved? Um, so with this, um, you know, back in the day, you notice we don't hear about the Dead Sea Scrolls anymore, right? You know, it used to be that even in school we heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, come to find out, the Dead Sea Scrolls pretty much agree with the King James Bible, and uh, so you hear a lot less about those now, and that also makes this, because there are some that fit over here, uh, but, you know, this is kind of now out. Uh, original manuscripts, and see here the early copies. This one is fairly accurate in that this here is the Septuagint. Codex Alexandrius Vicanicus Synacticus. So that's fine. But, but however, the newer versions of this drawing have everything resting on the Septuagint. And it doesn't. And remember, and I know you guys aren't going home and studying the Septuagint. Remember the Septuagint is the Greek, is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, er, largely everything we know about the Septuagint seems to be a lie. Um, and it, it really seems to be steeped in uh, Catholicism and all of that. Especially when you see that Codex Vaticanus, that should tell you something. And uh, so, but, but this one, so the rest, the newer ones that you see rest the ancient versions and ancient copies on the early copies and that's just not the way it is. Um, so, we have the Vulgate here, uh, Wycliffe, which is what we're going to be looking at today. The Latin Vulgate uh, is important just because of what it did and what it, what it was. It's not a foundation for anything we believe. It's not a foundation of the King James Bible other than the fact that it plays, it plays a part. But no translation was brought off of there. And so the Vulgate, Tyndale did look at it, but then that brings us up here to the Douay version, which is the Catholic Bible. Anyways, Revised Standard Version and American Standard Version are somewhat, they're supposed to be revisions of the King James Bible, but they aren't. And, uh, but those are really coming off the Septuagint, but they weren't, they didn't take out, you know, delete the verses that now all these other ones do. These other ones are based on the Septuagint alone. Um, and so here we have the King James Bible, which is the last Bible uh, in the English to be using the Masoretic text of the Old Testament and the Texas Receptus of the New. It's the last one, and uh, the New King James wasn't. It's the King James Bible that was. And uh, so ancient versions, and you see everything resting here, and you see Wycliffe's version right here that came out in 1380. John Wy Wycliffe. So let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Oh, I also have something to show you while you're turning there. This, I learned some new things even about the King James Bible this week. And uh, or yesterday, this is a pure Cambridge edition. And so when I heard pure, you know, my antennas are going up, and they gave these to all pastors that came and were tenants. And uh, so a pure Cambridge edition. So when we talk, when we get here in a moment, Second Timothy three sixteen. Uh, go ahead and go over there. Now I'll just tell you a little bit about this. So. Cambridge and Oxford are two universities with a lot of money. You know where they got their money? Printing Bibles. Who knew? Uh, Cambridge got to the uh, play a little sooner. Oxford then decided, hey, we want to make money like they are, extend, extend our campuses. And so they wanted to print a King James Bible as well, but they had to change a few things in order to do it. And so if you look at your Bibles, you might have an Oxford you might have a Cambridge. And if it's by Zondervan or something like that, then, or an open Bible or something of that nature, then there's probably some other words changed. However, I'm only telling you, well, I'm telling you this because you, know, you, you should know that there's others. 
Um, you know, if it's Nelson, uh, Zondervan, uh, any of those things, then each printer takes a little bit of license in their printing. And uh, so, but this one is considered the one that goes to the, the proper, um, okay, well, let me say this. So what the difference is between this and say you have in your, your lap maybe a Nelson uh, from Nelson Publishers or Zondervan is that where this is going to say something like thoroughly uh, furnished unto good works, yours is going to say thoroughly. So when even when we're talking about changes, we're still talking about the Word of God. You're still carrying the Word of God. It just says thoroughly instead of thoroughly. I'm okay with that. I don't know if you are, but if you aren't, then that's probably what you probably need to pick up one of these. Uh, but however, uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, sometimes it, where the Bible might, this would say astonishing, yours would stay astonished. Still the Word of God. It's, it's not been changed. And uh, so, but when we look at this, there's an interesting thing here. Um, oh, no, I don't want to get there yet. Are we 2 Timothy 3.16? Have we read it yet? I haven't read it yet. Though. Okay. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The interesting thing is when Paul wrote that, you know, he was writing an original, but however, uh, you know, all Scripture is given by inspiration. Now, God breathed, so God breathed, men wrote. That's how it worked. Now, when we say inspired, we're talking about a process that happened there. But however, the Bible is still alive. So in that, it, it, and I think I've made that clear, uh, that, uh, that you know, we have an inspired Bible here. We have a, and a book that's alive. The whole process is an inspiration. Uh, but however, what, you know, what we have in our King James Bible wasn't spoken by God to somebody. But what did happen is there was a translation that happened, but God's hand was in it that brought then about preservation. So if you'll please turn your Bible to Psalm chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now it's interesting, if you look up here, I forget how it happens, but the King James Bible is the seventh English, seventh major English version. Somebody brought up a good point. What, or, uh, Brother Swift was talking about this. And notice there, there were other countries that in their language started to print Bibles, like the Spanish Bible was, uh, was set up to be the Bible that was going to be used probably as the King James. But the Catholics got in, were able to corrupt it. And uh, so, but the thought process was brought, would have everything fallen underneath the Spanish Empire instead of the British Empire? Except that the British Empire brought about the, uh, the proliferation of Scripture, uh, the birth of a, uh, not the birth of a language, Eng English had already been around, but, you know, every country just about that's, that's modern, you know, somebody speaks English there. And uh, so the question is brought up, had, you know, some other country, if Spain would have had, you know, could we be speaking Spanish today and have been, you know, maybe declared independence 200 years ago from the Spaniards or the French had something close that happened and some history that I, that I was not aware of. But however, um, when we're talking about the Bible and the English, we're talking about a purification process. And then we have the King James Bible, which is uniquely and uh, blessed all throughout you know, the last 400 years of human history. And uh, so with that, there's also seven... Now remember, the King James Bible, 1611, there weren't new revisions, but there were additions. And when I say additions, I'm saying E-D-I-T-I-O-N-S, not A-D-D, not additions, additions. And uh, so with those, there's also been seven of those. Uh, like, for instance, on the first, uh, I don't know if you got to be in there with it. You know, I've shown you a facsimile of the 1611, the Gothic print and putting everything where it goes. And Esther, the word he was used instead of she in a, you know, in a, in a weird place. And then it's called the he Bible. And then when it was replaced, they put she where it's supposed to be. That was called the she Bible. But when they did fix that one, they also made some other errors when they were putting those things in their place and figuring out everything. And so a he Bible, no, wait. Yeah, a he Bible is apparently, if you can find one, is worth like $300,000. She Bible, which would be second edition, uh, would be, matter of fact, the, I think it is, 
the he bible then when it says thou shalt not commit adultery uh, the word not is not there in the bible and so it's thou shalt commit adultery um, you know so things like that were happening but there's seven different additions that then get us to this one which they're all the same except for astonished astonished uh, we can pull out my 1611 facsimile and uh, pull this out. They're going to say the same thing. People tell you, well, you know, that one's had different revisions, and it hasn't. Uh, it just simply hasn't. We have the 1611 there. We have this, uh, which I think we said, what, 1769 or whatever the case is, uh, the final time that something uh, was uh, brought about to change there. But did we ever get to Psalm 12, 6, and 7? Yeah, yeah we're going to read it again, though. Yeah. Um, the words of the Lord are pure words. The silver tried to first verse purified seven times. Okay, that's where we were. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And so, you know, if we, we believe that God spoke and then the originals, that they're perfect documents. The thing is, those perfect documents have never been together. The first word of God that was given was given to Moses. God wrote on tablets the Ten Commandments. A thought was brought up. Do you realize that nobody's ever seen the Ten Commandments penned by God? Moses was coming down and saw everything was going on, threw him down, smashed him, and from that point, God said, now you write. I'm tired of writing. You're writing now. And so when Moses went back down with the Ten Commandments, he had his copies. But nobody ever questioned it. those two tables. Where are they now? They're in the Ark of the Covenant, Remember? If the Ark of the Covenant is still around. I mean, I would imagine it is. I don't know. But those two copies that Moses wrote are in the, uh, in the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus, as he sat down to say, this scripture has been fulfilled today in your ears from Isaiah 61. Or is it 62? And, uh, and he says, this scripture has been fulfilled. Jesus was reading copies of copies. But he still said, this is scripture. This is perfect. Not one jot, not one tittle. And that word right there in Psalm 12, 7... Uh, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And so we do have originals that were perfect, but if we, the, you know, Genesis through Revelation were never together. Old Testament, of course, times it wouldn't have been. And then all of a sudden, by the time Revelation's written towards the end of the first century, of course, none of those were put together. And it was hundreds of years before all of those 66 books were placed together in canon. So does that mean that we didn't have a Bible until then? And that's preposterous. We've always had the Word of God. We have the Word of God now. We had it then. And uh, so when we're talking about here what's up on the screen... We're talking about how did, of course, we look here at the original manuscripts. That's inspiration. Then everything going forward then is preservation. And then, of course, that's junk, junk, junk. Uh, but when we look at these, all right, let's talk about John Wycliffe, shall we? John Wycliffe was born somewhere between 1320 and 1330. And he lived until 1384. He's called the morning star of the Reformation. So the Reformation was a time of openness, which by the way, then you have the time of Reformation. Then you have, you know, when you come up on the Dark Ages, we're getting towards the end of it here. You know, we talk about the Dark Ages and all the plagues and everything that was going on. Uh, there was no, no word of God. There were people, pockets of people like us that, that believe like we do, who had, you know, just very little scripture, very little... Uh, as far as means, as far as having it, but they were still out witnessing. People were still getting saved. John Wycliffe was a Catholic priest, but however, he's called the Morning Star of the, of the Reformation. So, which by the the, the Reformation started about fifteen, uh, what seventeen, and then there was the Diet of Worms, which Diet means council, and Worms is a city, and uh, so I've always always thought that was funny. Uh, the ninety five thesis uh, with um, Martin Luther and all that. But John Wycliffe was called the morning star of the Reformation because he believed the word of God was to be in the hands of the common people. <laughs> I, I, maybe I should, should have taken pictures and videotaped this thing. But as, as he's going around talking about the different Bibles, when you start getting to some of these, like the Great Bible, uh, the Bishop's Bible, these things were gigantic. I mean, we're talking Chris Rhodes walking around with Strong's Concordance size, gigantic. 35-pound Bibles. Can you imagine taking one of those home and reading it? But the printing press and everything was so 
far behind, when I say far behind, it was just a brand new thing, that what they would do is they would chain these Bibles to the pulpits and they would end up being read from there. And what would happen is not everybody could read. Remember here, okay, we're going back to Wycliffe. Notice the date there. We're going to 1380. We're going back to Middle English. And uh, so if you look at the page here, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to read. Uh, it's pretty difficult. And so, but what would happen is on these, when they started getting the, the things chained to the Bible, they didn't want to hear from the priest. They didn't want to hear from uh, the clergy. They just wanted to hear the Word of God. So what they would do is they would pay people who could read to come stand behind the pulpit, read this Bible, and people would come in and just listen. And so, you know, the, if people have the Word of God, and if you will read the Bible, if, if I could just get people to read their Bible, be a step in the right direction. We, you know, it, it solve so many things. So John Wycliffe's idea was that the Bible should be in the vernacular of the common people and in the hands of the common people, and it's that very thought that then eventually led to the Reformation. Uh, you know, hundred some odd years later, which is then brings us to a statement: If the Bible is so good at subverting the masses, why do most totalitarian te, why do most totalitarian reams ban it instead of using it? You know, we have people in this country that talk about religion being the opioid of the masses. You know, they're just using that Bible to control you. <laughs> but yet if you go, you know, to, you know, North Korea, you can't, you get, you'll get arrested for carrying a Bible in. You may even go prison camps. Uh, you know, you would think that Kim Jong-il, you know, if the Bible is so good at helping you subvert the masses, that that'd be, the, everybody would have a Bible. But it's a lie. The Bible frees people. If you will just get in and read it, you'd see it. Um, but so I'm going to say it again. If the Bible is so good at subverting the masses, why do the most totalitarian reams, regimes, not reams, regimes uh, throughout history ban it instead of using it? Uh, so back in these days, back at the time of the 1300s, what was happening was mystery plays. They couldn't read, so you know whatever scripture they had, they would be acting out. Um, so John Wycliffe was an English scholastic philosopher. Theologian, 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 uh, biblical translator, reformer, priest, and a seminary professor at the University of Oxford. He became an influential uh, dis, dis, dissident in the Roman Catholic priesthood during the 14th century and is considered an important pre predecessor to Protestantism. I can't talk tonight. Protestantism. Um, he attacked Catholicism from within. He said there was no scriptural foundation for a pope. Uh, when you're a Catholic, that tends to get people to hate you. Uh, criticized trans transubstantiation, which if I know Chris, that's when that's wafer uh, turns into your body, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they're teaching that when you eat the wafer from uh, communion, that it's the body, actual body and blood of Jesus Christ ends up being part of your body. That's just not the case. Of course, he knew this. Of course, he got in the Bible and was able to read it. Um, most of his time was at Oxford. Oh, wait, I need to show you this guy, don't I? There we go. Um, most of his time was at Oxford University, both as a student and professor. And then he was used by King Edward III for debate. And through this process, then his group then began, uh, it began the Lollards. L-O-L-L-O-A-R-D-S. Did I put that in your thing? So it means poor priests or poor preachers. And what they did is they went out so late. Um, you can look uh, yourself. If you were to go Google John Wycliffe and you find that that's exactly what they were doing. Um, in 1378, he published uh, De Verte Secre Scripture, uh, which I'm sure says something in English. But he said this, All God's children are equal and are equally able to understand the Scriptures. He said this, Christ and his apostles taught the people that the tongue, uh, in that tongue that was best known to them, why should men not do so now? So he was completely against using foreign language, uh, you know, say as Latin, um, for uh, teaching the scriptures. But you go back here, you, know, you see the Latin Vulgate uh, there at the bottom. You know, the Latin Vulgate here, which then the Douay version. Uh, so, you know, Latin was spoke, spoken by a lot of people back in the day, but it's a dead language now. Matter of fact, it was a dead language by then, too. So he believed that the Bible should be uh, in the vernacular of the common people. So the Wycliffe. English Bible came about in 1380. 
And I'm going to read you this paragraph. You ready? In keeping with uh, Wycliffe's uh, belief that Scripture was the only authoritative, reliable guide to the truth about God, he became involved in efforts to translate the Bible into English. While Wycliffe is credited, is not, uh, it is not uh, possible to exactly define his part in the translation, which is based on the Vulgate. Uh, there is no doubt that it, uh, it, was in, it was his initiative and his leadership and that the success of the project was due to these. From him comes the translation uh, of the New Testament, which is smoother, clearer, clearer, and more readable than the rendering of the Old Testament by his friend, uh, Nicholas of Hereford. Uh, the whole was revised by Wycliffe's younger contemporary, John Purvey, in 1388. So remember, the King James Bible, people say it's Old English. It isn't. It's Modern English. You go back to John Wycliffe, and that's Middle English. And uh, I'm going to show you here. Uh, uh, well, there's another uh, little part of it. Can anybody read that? Apparently they could at the time. Now notice that's handwritten also. In the beginning. I see prayers on the top. Many prayers. <laughs> yeah. And so I also have here, we just, I just put the text. So John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And the Wycliffe, for God loved so the world that he uh, gave there his own begotten son, the esh man that believeth in him perish not, but have everlasting life. But, uh, well, it could be also you know, like the S's and F's things, you know, yeah, that they're yeah. trying to do. Which, interesting enough, was brought up during the, during the thing. The guy who first did the 1611 Bible and did it in the Gothic print that was... Uh, so what he... Mark Smith says it was a mistake, the print face, that he was just trying to make it majestic for the king. But if he had not done that, it probably would have you know, caught on a little bit sooner. Uh, it took the King James Bible about 50 years to uh, catch on and uh, surpass the one that uh, was right before it. Um, so with the Wycliffe Bible, there still exists about 150 manuscripts, complete or partial, containing the translation in its revised form. 150 manuscripts, imagine that. These were all done by hand and drawn. Um, I forget which Bible it was. Uh, I think it was the Bishop's Bible. You know, Mark Smith has copies of all this stuff. And he has machines that does facsimiles. Uh, some of it valuable, some of it only worth a couple hundred because of what they're doing to it. Uh, but, you know, if you were to buy, I think it's a Bishop's Bible... It, you know, which would be horribly expensive. You know, it was back in what the 1500s, whatever the case was. You'd also have to hire an illustrator to draw the artwork that's supposed to be everywhere, and then somebody to come in and do all the punctuation. That was Gutenberg. I can't remember which one it was. Gutenberg. And uh, so you had to hire somebody as an artist, and you had to hire somebody to come in and put all the punctuation in. And there was a map to tell that person how to do it. And uh, so just the expense of having a Bible. Uh, but when it came down to, you know, the, some of them, it was just the difference of like, you know, the ba great Bible and, uh, and some of those were just so big that they weren't going to catch on. The King James Bible came along and, you know, size you can hold in your hand. Um, Wycliffe uh, English version is uh, from the Latin Vulgate, which is Catholic instead of the Greek and Hebrew. Um, it is not a large influence on later English version versions. But the idea was that the Bible in the hands of as many as people should be in as many the Bible in the hands of as many people as possible and in their vernacular. So although we come back over here, of course we're going to list it and uh, show it in uh, this thing here, it doesn't really have the idea is foundational. But however, very few of the versions that are coming up later are actually even based on the White Cliff. It's not because he didn't do a good job, uh, but it was just from the Latin. You know, we believe that the Bible comes from the Hebrew and the Greek, not the Latin. And uh, so he had did he uh, wrote what he had available to him, and, uh, and and so you have that there. So John Wycliffe died in 1384. Um, and so, but the Catholic Church hated him so much at the Council of Constance in 1425, Wycliffe was declared a heretic. So this would have been roughly 40 years after he was dead. His bones were dug up, burned, and then scattered in a river. 
40 years after he was dead because he's trying to get the Bible into the hands of regular people. So the Wycliffe version is the first version of the Bible in English. It's Middle English, and it's based on the Latin. We do not agree with Latin, with Latin as a foundational document, especially being a Catholic document. So it's, we're not basing, you know, the Wycliffe version up is, isn't here because it was foundational as a scholarly document, although it was scholarly. It, it was as a scholarly document, but maybe not in the line of the preservation of the King James Bible. It's here because his ideas were right and that the Bible should be in the hands of the people, and the Catholic Church disagreed with that. You know, there's only certain people in the Catholic Church that are allowed at this time to even read the Bible. They had to be authorized to do so. And then you told people what to believe. Wycliffe didn't believe that. He believed the Bible should be in your hand so you can figure it out yourself. So then what did you mean when you said being, um, being purified seven times, and then you said King James was the seventh? Mm-hmm. Written okay, so Wycliffe wouldn't be included in that because it's off the Latin. So okay. Tyndale, one. I thought you said Wycliffe was the seven. No. Wycliffe isn't in the seven, I don't believe. So Tyndale, one. Coverdale, two. Matthews, three. Great, four. Geneva, five. Bishop, six. King James, seven. Okay. But there's also okay. been seven editions of the King James Bible. And when we say editions, we're not talking about Verses changing, words changing. We're talking about typeface. We're talking about you know corrections to the um, mistakes that printers might have made. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're only talking about Wycliffe because of his philosophy. Matter of fact, you know some of these other Bibles. You know, just because it's in the lineage doesn't mean that we would ever consider it the Word of God. Um, part of the problem with these Bibles, you know, Bishop's Bible, the Great Bible, Matthew's Bible was people were putting their secretarian, their individual opinions into Scripture. And that's one of the things, when we get to the King James Bible, we're going to talk about Hampton Court, which is where this idea was conceived in 1604. And the rules were brought about about translation. You know, we're not going to let the Catholics put this in there. We're not going to let the Anglicans put this in there. Remember, King James was, a, was an Anglican himself. You know, we're not going to let these people do this. It's going to be a scholarly word for word, true type, from the text, translation. But we're going to get that when we get the King James Bible. And then, you know, all right, so next week uh, we'll then probably talk about Tyndale. Tyndale was burnt at the stake by the Catholics too, now that I think about it, wasn't he?